One second. I think I need to mirror my desktop real quick. There you go. So hi, um, I'm definitely wearing the right shirt. I don't know if you can see this. It kind of relates to the last talk. Um, so I'm going to be talking about streams. And streams are uh, in Node Core. Um, the reason why I'm decided to give a talk about streams is, uh, first of all, they are awesome. And second of all, uh, there has been some confusion lately about streams, um, mainly because there was a Streams 1 implementation, and then there was a Streams 2, and now there's a Streams 3. And I myself was confused as to what can I do with the streams, what should I call, what should I not call, to not go into old mode or whatever, and um, how, how can I implement the new streams. So in this talk, I will first give a general introduction uh, what streams are. These concepts are not just related to Node. Um, so I, I will just explain streams in general. And then I will show how to use them in Node and how to implement them in Node. So let's start with a readable stream. So a readable stream is basically a source of data. In this case, the data are, uh, are lemmings. Um, there are, this is one way to consume a readable stream. Uh, there are multiple ways, but uh, we will get to that in a, in a second. <clears throat> one thing to notice that streams one, which by the way I will refer to as old streams, so old streams were not very lemming friendly, because if you did not subscribe to the on data event in time, and the lemmings were already coming out, those would not get a parachute. This is a writable stream. And a writable stream is just a destination of data. Like, I'm just, you know, write the data somewhere. I don't know what's going to happen with that. It may go to the file system. It may go to the network. I don't really care. That's being handled. Um, but I just basically write it, and I'm done. And kind of in the middle is the transform stream. And a transform stream is basically a, a duplex stream. And it's called duplex because it has a readable site and a writable stride. So in this case, we are writing cavemen, and then we transform them, and on the other end, someone could read the pigs. The cool thing is that whoever is downstream reading the pigs doesn't have to know that originally they were cavemen. So this is really nice for uh, connecting different streams that work with different data types. You just put a transform in the middle, and, and then they can work together. Now let's talk about the readable stream in a little more detail. Um, if you look at the code in, in Node Core, um, as far as I can tell, most of the code is actually inside the readable base class. So there are two ways to consume a Node readable stream. And this is one way. You're getting data pushed at you. You have no control over when you get the next chunk. So this guy better swallow up, or it will spill, or whatever will happen. This is another form of a, push, a readable stream consumed as a push stream. Um, also here, if the cat was not in position um, when the milk starts coming out, with streams one, that milk would be spilled. However, in the new streams, that's no longer an issue. Or it's much, let's say it's much easier to get it right. This one is a pull stream. In this case, you have full control over when you get the next chunk. There's no data just coming at you, and you kind of have to handle it. It's you decide when you get the next chunk. Whenever you process that chunk, you get the next one. And there's actually another um, analogy that kind of works very well. If you think of, of a doctor's office, and you have a doctor in there, and he has to treat patients. So the doctor is basically a transform. He transforms sick patients into healthy patients, hopefully. And he, the office could be set up two ways. One way would be that whenever the doctor is ready for the next patient, he opens the door to the waiting room and pulls in the next patient. And then he treats that patient. And when that patient, let's just say the patient walks out the other door now, and then he pulls in the next patient, and so on. However, it could happen that when he opens the waiting room, there are like no patients in there, right? So he's like, okay, nothing to do. He goes, sits down on his desk, 
or at his desk. And, and after a while, he goes back and looks again. Still no patient. He keeps doing that. And there's really no sense, and he gets kind of tired of that, and then he put, just puts a bell. So if the waiting room is empty, you're the first patient, just ring the bell. And then I know there are more patients, and then I know to pull in the next one. However, this could also be implemented in a different way. The doctor could say, you know what, I just want to sit here in my office. And he tells the nurses to just push in the patients as they come in. So he's treating a patient, and suddenly the nurse pushes in the next one. He's like, okay, I'm still treating this one. What do I do? Well, maybe he has got like three chairs set up. He tells the patient to sit down, kind of buffers the patients there. But you know, if, if more patients keep coming in, he may be running out of chairs. And at some point, you know, the office is just full, and he can really not treat any more patients like that. So he has to apply something we call back pressure. So he says, okay, hold on, no more patients for now. I want to first, you know, handle these ones, and I will tell you when I handled all the patients that are currently in my office. And then you can start pushing patients again. And there's another thing I did to show this a little bit, if I can find it. All right, I made a visualization for this. So in this case, we have kids building snowmen up here. And these snowmen are just coming in. And on the second level, we are trying to convert these snowmen into water. So we're kind of heating up the second level. So snowmen come in. And we're starting to convert those into water, but you know, we're still trying to heat up the room, and, and, and they're just not melting. So we kind of start filling up more and more. And we, we see that we're starting to fill up, and we're like, OK, no, no, hold on. And we tell the kids to stop building snowmen. And, and the kids are like, OK, our room is also full of snowmen, so let's just you know, leave them there and keep um, keep them there and not build any more snowmen. And now our room starts getting hot enough, and we can start converting them into water. So we do that. And at the same time, we still apply the back pressure. And the poof, all the snowmen are gone. And then we remove, you know, we say, OK, no more back pressure. You can now start giving us more snowmen. But first, you could say, OK, let's empty our room first. And so they drain their snowmen. And once that's done, now they start building more snowmen. And that can repeat indefinitely. So if, if every time we have too many snowmen, we can apply back pressure and so on. So it's kind of like a, a balance back and forth. Now we're going to come to actual note. And uh, there are two parts here. One is how we consume those streams, which is actually rather simple. And, and the other one is going to be how we actually implement them. So <clears throat> if we talk about push streams, which, by the way, in, um, in Node, there is no such thing as a push stream or a pull stream. There's just a readable stream. And however you consume it makes it go into flowing mode or non-flowing mode, which basically uh, matches uh, push or pull. So, so we have, here we have a readable stream. And th as, as soon as we pipe, it actually registers an on-data event, which makes it flow. And then we can pipe, uh, we get the readable site, we pipe that to our transform, which then on the writable, on its readable site, pipes it into the next transform, and so on, until at the end we write it to some writable. And we also can apply some error handlers, uh, or if you want to know when, when the stream ends. We can also do this by hand. We can actually subscribe to the on data event ourselves and, and handle this. So that's one way, and that's really, really simple, right? I mean, it's pretty obvious. Um, the pull streams. Those are streams that are still in non-flowing mode. And uh, as far as I understand, all streams start out in non-flowing mode. They only start flowing once you subscribe to OnData. And how do we get values out of those readable streams? Well, we read. So we say readable.read. But there may not be a value at some point, right? We may read three times, and then there's no more value, which is kind of like the waiting room is empty. And what we do then is we want to say, OK, uh, no point for me to keep reading, but could you please let me know when there's data available again, and we register uh, the readable event. And that's basically the bell that the doctor would install. Now about implementing streams. So the readable stream, you just, oh, one thing I should say, um, node two and three, they give you 
uh, base classes uh, that help you to implement these streams. So they kind of do a bunch of stuff under the hood, and you just basically inherit from them, and then you implement certain methods to, to make them work uh, for your case. So for the readable, you uh, implement underscore read. For the writable, you implement underscore write. And for the transform, you implement underscore transform. And if you want to add extra data at the, uh, after the upstream ended, you do a flush. And now we get into more detail for each. Um, the most important part is actually the last three lines. Um, so just look at those mostly. So in this case, um, we implement read. And what basically happens is that the, our underscore read is called exactly once. And it will never be called again until we push a chunk into the readable. And once we do that, then it will call our underscore read again. So we could basically uh, do some work here and do something asynchronously. Like we could go to the, to the web, pull something down. And if you want to say, OK, we are done, there's no more data coming from us, we are going to uh, push null. That signals that the stream is done. The stream will be officially ended. If anyone tries to read from it in the future, it will throw an error. The writable stream, again, the last three lines are most important. Um, so it basically writes a chunk to us. That's the first argument. The second argument is the encoding. That's not always important. Last argument is a callback. So what we do is we just process the, the chunk. And when we're done processing, we call back. It's that easy. If an error occurs, we pass an error. Otherwise, we just call back with nothing. And in this case, we're actually doing an asynchronous write. We're, the sync is basically an async function, and it will call back once it's done. And all this you know, worrying about you know, keeping the buffers at a certain level and applying back pressures if the buffers fill up, all that's handled for you under the hood, which is the cool thing about streams, the new streams. The old streams didn't really do that. You kind of had to uh, do more manual stuff there. A transform stream looks very simple, similar to the so the writable, because it is a writable, but it's also readable. So in this case, we will basically also process the, the chunk, but what we're doing is we're transforming it into something else, and whatever that result is, we push that. However, we can push as many times as you want, or we cannot push at all. So if you want to implement a filter, you just push never, and then you call back, and that value just disappears. But if you maybe have three values that result from one value due to your transform, you push three times, and then you call back. And as I said, and again, it's very easy this way to implement asynchronous transforms. And I actually did one where I was pulling down URLs in my transform. So I, I got URLs pushed at me. And then I pulled down URLs. Um, I actually went to the URL and pulled down the HTML. And then I pushed the HTML. So you can actually do things like that. And it's very easy because uh, asynchronicity is very much supported. And then if you want to add like a footer or something, then you could implement underscore flush. That gets called after the upstream ended. And then you can push whatever else you need to push. And as I keep mentioning, there's a lot of stuff going on under the hood for you, like the, the whole back pressure thing, the whole buffering. And in order to make this a little, show you how cool it actually is, um, I made a stream visualization that kind of shows you how this works. And I know the network is bad, but if you want to play with it, you could, I made a bitly link there for this. So this is uh, stream this. Um, I'm first going to explain a little bit what this does, and then we're going to restart it. So on the left side, we have numbers which is a readable stream. And these numbers, you can kind of see the 23 is the current last push number. And those numbers then get transformed into powers of the number, um, like 2 times 2, 4. And on the very right side, we have the tar pit, which basically we throw the numbers in, and they kind of take a while to sink in. And that's a writable stream. So, and what you see below are um, the, the buffers, basically. How, how much did the buffers fill up? And the maximum of each buffer is whatever the high watermark that I specified, which then the stream's implementation will handle for me to never go past that watermark. 
And down here, you have a little more information about what actually the stream state currently is. And what I'm basically using to do this is uh, node core streams expose readable states and writable states, which you can basically watch and see what's going on. So I'm going to restart this now. And actually, we're going to start with this. So, uh-oh. That's not good. OK, I can simulate this, not a big deal. So what we'll do, if they're all at 200, if I can get that anyways, all right. So if they're all at 200, that means they all have the same speed. Oh, I forgot to mention that line chart there basically shows you the stream speed, like how many chunks per millisecond am I handling. So now they should all go back to normal at some point, because they're going to be fast enough. All right. So, but what you can see here, the writable is kind of half full there, and um, and now they're kind of it's kind of stays at the same buffer, but nothing is really blocking anymore. You can see it just keeps flowing. Uh, the readable gets drained here on the left side and keeps emitting values. Um, let's go to the next one, um, where we actually make the top bit a little slower. So now, if I make the top bit slower on the right side, you can see that the buffer is filling up. And now on the, you can see the um, power stream is kind of backing up because the buffer is filling. And now everything stops. And that's because now the, they're all waiting for the torpid to finally handle um, all these uh, chunks that it can't process in time. So I can make this a little faster. And now I will drain this. And now you can see that everything starts working again. So, so all this. Um, I mean, it's very, very important that this is really good, <clears throat> handled well for you because in Node, you want to stay with low memory. Like, you don't want to just keep buffering indefinitely because that was, those values would stay in memory. Um, so you want to make sure that you know, it only fills the buffer up to a certain extent, and then it actually tells the upstream to just stop pushing data. And um, if you are interested in this, I'm actually working on uh, a streams view, which will allow you to watch streams that are running on your server side, and you get a visualization like that. So if you're kind of wondering what part of your streams is slow, uh, you can use that and visualize your streams that way. And if you're interested in that, you should follow me in GitHub and or Twitter. And that's it. Thank you.